circle nearest is the smoothest, most award-winning premium American whiskey. Looks like the world is falling in love. Chances are you will too. afternoon good day whatever time of day it is that you're watching this um, and welcome to uh, another tales of the cocktail seminar talk uh, doing uh, we're doing the, uh, the, uh, the the new version the new style actually online um, as such we all know the reason why we don't need to go into too much details but of course the most important thing is to get the message across to learn to educate to share and that's what we're hoping today for people to come away from this with some more knowledge and understanding of how our community, uh, the bar community, the spirits industry works. So today's session is about the under, underserved communities, entrepreneurship and capital. Actually, when we actually proposed this seminar, um, we actually proposed this about two years ago, it was actually myself and Jackie Summers actually proposed this and we actually combined two seminars together. So we will be delving into some other, um, other topics in the short space of time that we have. But um, the question, the main question we want to pose are, is are people from the underserved community afforded the same opportunity um, as other people within our industry? Uh, we look at this question, we look at other, other little details um, with some amazing entrepreneurs. And that's, that's I love that word entrepreneur, because it just means it, it always encompasses something special about special people. And we have three amazing entrepreneurs here. And I'm so very fortunate that they said yes, it was be part of this, this presentation. But um, I want to jump straight into introducing them. So first we have an entrepreneur named Jackie Summers. And some of you may know Jackie, a legend in, in my mind and probably most of your mind here. But just in case you don't know much about Jackie, Jackie is a New York-based food writer, speaker, a distiller, um, author of a soon-to-be-published illustrated book about social justice. He's been sharing stories about experience of racism in the drinks industry for decades, and I've been actually following him for about uh, a decade. Um, and though, and through this nationwide, what we're seeing now are around the world with the Black Lives Matter, it seems like people are actually listening to Jackie. Finally, <laughs> actually, he actually made a quote which was really funny. He says, "It feels like I've been saying UFOs are real." And people are actually been starting to believe him now. So, so that's Jackie Summers. Um, there should be, see if this was live now, there'll be a crowd going, I'll, I'll clap for you, Jackie. <laughs> um, next, we have uh, Karen Hoskin. Now, Karen's a good old friend of mine, not that old, but good old friend of mine. Karen's a, another entrepreneur. Again, I love that word. Maybe she's saying a French accent. My French is terrible. Um, Karen's an entrepreneur for over 20 years, most recently as the owner and founder of a craft distillery in Mon well, called Montana. I'm going to try and work, try and remember where it's called. Crested Boot? Crested Butt? Crested Boot? Crested Butte in the mountains of Colorado. It's Colorado. <laughs> Colorado. I haven't been there yet, but I'm not, I've been to Colorado, but I haven't been to the distillery yet, but I know I'm going to go there being a rum ambassador. So anyway, so she's a founder of the Craft Distillery, um, Craft Distillery and the Rum, Montana Rum in Colorado, and as co-founder also of Zoita, which she's going to speak a little bit more about. Karen loves to talk about being a, a social entrepreneur. Um, she talks about zero waste products. She consults. Um, she offers advice for other businesses, um, various different other business. Karen speaks frequently on across the nation and oversees environmental and social sustainability um, talks. Um, in fact, that's one, of, that's one of the things that's very dear to our heart. Um, she's a leader within the industry. She also talks about premium rum, of course, naturally, and the art of distillation as well, which is another thing that's dear to my heart. So I always look to tap into uh, Karen for distillation. And she's, uh, as I said, she's a known leader uh, for crashing through that glass ceiling as 
as you realize, as a woman within the industry, um, in a traditionally male dominated um, scenario of rum. So, uh, an honor to be, I'm honored honor to call Karen one of my friends and uh, I give Karen a big round of applause. There we go, sound effects. And finally, this is another person that I'm like, bowed out to. I actually met this lady in London and I was like, who's this lady here? Just holding center as she walked into the room. Everyone was like, turned around like, I said, yeah, that's power there. Um, we have finally Fawn Weaver. Fawn Weaver is a CEO and founder of Uncle Nearest, Uncle Nearest Tennessee Whiskey, Prima Whiskey, the fastest growing independent American whiskey brands in US history. That means in US history, that means it hasn't been done, the fastest growing uh, and most awarded American whiskey in 2019. And so far, uh, we're only six months into the year, so far in 2020 as well. Also, if I ever decide to get married, I don't think anyone wants me, but if I ever decide to get married, I'm going to form for counseling because I know she's an expert uh, when it comes to counseling and marriage and she's written books and, and uh, she also set up uh, the Happy Wives Club, which I probably won't be able to get a membership of. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's uh, part of what's good, her legacy. But what we know her and love her for is an amazing whiskey, uh, yes. Tennessee whiskey that she's launched and she founded, um, which tells a great story of Jack Daniels' mentor, which is uh, Uncle Nearest mm. Green. But we'll get onto that a little bit later. But give a big hand to uh, Fawn Weaver. <sighs> That's the end of the sound effects, and that's the end of the introductions. At the moment, all my guests are mute, but it just sounds like we're, we're on a Zoom call. We don't want to be on a Zoom call. We want to be like we're interacting with each other. So I might unmute, tell everyone to unmute so we can interact with certain types of comments um, and actually get people's uh, natural feedback. Uh, because, as I said, I'm from Europe. And in case you didn't know, I am. My name's Ian Bro. I'm the global ambassador for rum, which basically means I get to travel around the world, uh, work with various different brands uh, of rum that I enjoy drinking and get paid for doing it. That's all I do. <laughs> Drink rum. Why? Well, I also do a little other thing. I consult. The best rum in the world. I don't even understand. I still don't understand it. And I don't understand why everybody doesn't try to do that. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm the only one in the world that's done it when thought about it. I was like, well, why not? Yeah, I'm going to be the global ambassador for rum. So, yeah. So, I'm very fortunate. I get to consult with many different brands uh, and uh, help actually create my own brand finally. But anyway, we'll get onto that a little bit later. So, that's me. But I'm based in London based in England and you guys are over in the States. And as we know, tells the, a big American show and a big American event. And one of the, uh, one of the, um, uh, the, the words and the phrases I hear a lot of, uh, especially here in the UK is the underserved community. And it's something that doesn't really, doesn't really resonate as much uh, just because of that phrase here in the UK. So I'm hoping that you guys can shed a little bit of light um, to what the underserved community means to you. If I could start off with you, Jackie. What does uh, the underserved community mean to you? There are people who have made significant contributions to the liquor industry who historically have been uh, not able to profit or benefit from their contributions. We have now proof that uh, black people in, in America started cocktail culture, yet there are a few black uh, cocktail bar owners. We have proof that a uh, dive bar culture was started uh, by black people, yet there were a few black dive bar owners. We have proof, as Fawn will tell you, that black people were the first people to actually make good whiskey in this country. And yet there were a few black brand owners. So when we talk about an underserved community, we are talking about people that have been uh, historically not allowed, to not allowed to participate in the financial rewards of the cultural contributions that they have made and created. And that might be people of color, it is absolutely women. Uh, it is the whole spectrum of people who, again, have these significant contributions, but historically have not been able to benefit from what they've been able to produce and create. Excellent, excellent. So I wanna pose that same question to Karen, because uh, um, I, as I mentioned, when I first met you, and uh, I remember you was coming around uh, with tales with uh, your your little your little rum bottles and your samples and that type of stuff. Oh, sorry, I was supposed to say, oh, it's the old tales, the old owners, the new tales. You don't do that, but the old tales, uh, you didn't, and you didn't see uh, many women, especially in the rum industry as such. Everyone knows the the the, the, the pinnacle, um, or, or when you see the people like Joyce Spencer, Maggie Campbell, but that's that was 
pretty much about it that came over to tells um is how how do you see yourself do you see yourself as part of the underserved community I took a long time thinking about this question because I think it's such a good question and I didn't want to do it anything but the best possible justice um, because it depends on which direction I'm facing on any given day. So sometimes I feel like I'm just part of such a privileged community and other days I feel like I'm part of an underrepresented community and it's it's so specifically when I speak today, I'm speaking as a female founder of a craft distillery in America 12 years ago. And you're absolutely right. So, so Ian and I first met when I was at Tales of the Cocktail more than 10 years ago, uh, probably 11 years ago, walking around with little samples of Montagne rum, um, really just like handing them to anybody that I felt might have an interest in getting feedback and hearing what they thought of the you know, the flavor profile. And it was, it was like, it just seemed like the craziest thing to them and to me because it was so rare, I guess. Um, first to see a female doing that. Second leads for the female to say, I'm actually making this myself. Um, and then third, of course, to be a rum brand from the mountains of Colorado. It was just, you know, it was a constant uphill battle plus it was probably like 2009 so we were in the middle of a crazy recession and I just started a company and um, there's so many different things but to me an underserved community really means if you were to look around in an industry or a place and you were to look kind of as Jackie said at the people who are able to make that into a life sustaining business for themselves whether it's um, being paid, whether it's growing their own company equity, whatever it happens to be, if you're seeing a big gap in that, um, whether it be women, whether it be people of color, whether it be you know people from around the world, um, whatever is the gap, I think it's worth identifying and figuring out if it's creating an environment that isn't serving the industry as a whole, because the, every industry is better when it's as diverse as possible. Um, and so for me, I was really aware that I would look around a room at a, at a conference for, you know, my industry and I would be one of, you know, maybe 10 women in a room of 1200 people, 800 people sometimes. And that felt like I must be operating at a, at a deficit. But also then I, when I would walk into a room with a venture capital company and I would be the only woman there, and then they would think that I was there to deliver their lunch. Um, that was really when it came home to me that I was uh, not—I was not functioning in an equal in an environment of equity. Wow! Wow! That's um, see, a lot of people don't wouldn't even that wouldn't even fathom to a lot of people because they they've never really walked in your shoes, especially um, us men. <laughs> Sometimes we 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 look we look at that and we say, "Wow, you know what? It never even I never even thought about that as such as being." underrepresented as a woman in that situation um, and it's something we have to stop and that's why I, I admire Jackie so much we have to stop and look at and say to yourself guys we need to actually look at ourselves from another point of view not from our own point of view um, but if we move over to Fawn and uh, at Fawn you get it from both ways <laughs> because <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a woman and you're an African-American or a black woman as well yeah. so um uh, but you've you've started off from a uh, from you've come from a different path um, into this industry. Uh, but what does the what does the underserved community mean to you um, within the spirits industry? You know, I think that just overall there is going to be an underserved in every industry, and that's not going to be unique to the American whiskey industry. When you look at our population, we're almost we're we're a little more than men at this point. I think we're like 50.04 or something like that. And but I mean, I can walk around in our industry and you know bump into four, and I know all of them because <laughs> there's not many of us in it. Uh, you know, I, I literally have a thing on my water bottle that says, I love being black. I love being black in every situation, in every environment. I love walking in to a room full of white men because guess who everybody will notice. And so I can, I can hold court because I don't look like anybody else there. And I love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coming into this industry, it was interesting 
because I've always been, the way that I approach everything is anything, any obstacle that's in the way, I will move it out of the way, I'll hop over it, I'll jump under it, whatever I have to do. And so I, I, I have to preface what I say with none of this bothered me. Yeah. Um, but what I, what I can say is when I first came into the industry, everyone I surrounded myself with, everyone that I brought on board uh, in my leadership were all women. I wasn't looking for women. It just so happens to be that the people who ended up around me that were the most skilled for the roles I were looking that I was looking for just happened to all be women. And I remember our head of whis uh, head of whiskey operations, Sherry Moore, hands down in this industry, there is no one with more experience in the Tennessee whiskey business than Sherry. And she is the person, if you remember uh, Jimmy Bedford, the prior master distiller for Jack Daniels, she's the person who trained Jimmy. Jimmy would go oh, wow. and do press conferences or press events and things, and she'd send them with post-it notes uh, in, wow. his be you know, in his beginning days. The current master distiller, Jeff Arnett, she hired and trained. The current uh, AGM at, at, at Jack Daniels, she hired and drained and, and they reported to her. So that's my head of whiskey operations, 30 now, 35, 36 years in nothing but Tennessee whiskey. So I don't care male, female, any color, nobody has more knowledge than, than she does. And so it was Sherry, myself and our SVP now, she's now our SVP of global sales and marketing, Kate Jerkins. And I brought her over from another one of my investments that she ran as VP of sales and marketing. And when I reached into her, I said, listen, this this thing that we're about to do you're the person to do it and her first response to me was fun you do realize i drink chardonnay <laughs> hey yeah that's all right you're gonna fall in love with whiskey and you're the person because you have the heart to be able to tell this story alongside me and to really think outside the box and i knew coming into this industry every everyone had sort of a prescribed way of the way you should grow your brand and the things that you should do and consequently, 99% of the craft distillers that come in or craft brands fail because they're all following this playbook that people say you should follow. And so I grabbed these folks and said, scrap the playbook. We're not doing anything along the playbook. And so I remember in the beginning, we're making phone calls for things that we really needed. So call it, you know, co-packers and, and <laughs> bottling equipment and corks and just simple stuff that you can't actually have a brand without. And I remember after maybe about a month or so, Kate, Sherry, and I were all talking and realized we all had the same exact problem, which is none of us were getting our phone calls returned. And I just thought it was absolutely odd that from a sales and marketing side, from the distribution side, from the you know bottling co-packing side, no one was returning our calls. And so I, I, I was on the line with them and I said, guys, I wanna just test something because it just dawned on me that we are in a male dominated field and I bet you these guys are not used to hearing from powerful women. So I call my husband who's an executive VP over at Sony Pictures who has a full-time job, who's really, really busy and all you'd have to do is Google him to know who he is and what he does. And I said, hey, babe, can you call all of these people that won't call us back and tell them that you are the CEO of Uncle Nears Premium Whiskey? Right. Okay. And <laughs> every single person, he literally, he says, okay, just everybody send me your emails of who you've been trying to get in contact with and give me a little mm -hmm. synopsis so I don't sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. And he then called all of the people we had been trying to get in touch with for four to six weeks, no phone calls, no matter how much wow. follow up. And he either got through at the first try or they would call him back within hours. And at some uh, point in that conversation, it would go to, hey, do you golf? Do you drink beer? You want to meet? I mean, like it was just. And so for, for about, if you actually Google any interview I did for the first two years, you will never see CEO listed as a part of my duties. What you wow. will see is me listed as chief historian. And the reason wow. I did that is I really didn't care how people viewed me. What I care is I set a goal that I wanted to hit and however I, wanted, how, however I had to do it is what we were gonna do. And so at one point about a few months into this arrangement, my husband calls me, he goes, babe, we're Remington still. <laughs> 
But I mean, for it took people a minute before they realized I wasn't just the PR person. I wasn't just the historian. Uh, it, it took folks in this industry a second. And, and I don't, you know, I don't care because obviously it didn't impact anything. But, but it does speak to what Karen was, was talking about is, is they just aren't used to women being in this industry. And quite frankly, they're still having to adjust. They're still yeah. figuring it out. And, you know, I come from the school of thought of I'm not going to adjust to you. You have to adjust to me. So, that's, uh, <laughs> so it, it's been fine for me. But yes, I, I do understand what, what Karen is saying because I walk into a room and, and I can point out, you know, for women and of course I know them all in this industry. Oh, can you can you imagine now if you was a, a black man like about seven, eight years ago trying to set up a uh, let's say a Caribbean spice look here. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine that? Uh, Jackie. Sure. Can you tell us? Out of New York from all places. No, I could not. <laughs> Jackie, but I do, some but of I, the challenges you had. But, but I do think the Jackies and the Karens that have been in this for a decade, I can say that I've not had a difficult time in this industry. I mean, once people realize we're here to play, mm. the I've not I've not experienced the barriers. I've not experienced the challenges. And I think that a part of that has to do with the fact that the Jackies and the Karens came first. And so they to paved the way. They paved yeah. the way. And so at least folks were used to seeing it, even if they're not used to seeing it from a level of success, they at mm. least had seen it. Where yeah. when Jackie and Karen came in, they were like aliens. <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't really seen it before. Uh, so I have the blessing of coming in after folks have seen it, even if they didn't know what to do with it, at least they had seen it. And, and I think it gave me an ability to maneuver a lot easier than, uh, than the folks who came before me. Jackie, so, so what were some of the challenges you had when you were setting up your company, your, your sorrow company at first? Well, the challenges come in two levels. The first is actually getting enough financing to get started. Uh, right. it's, we can document historically that underserved communities get funded from investors at a, at a much lower rate, and they get bank loans at either lower rates or higher interest rates. So just getting started, getting your company off the ground, getting, getting the financial backing you need in order to get started, it's significant. It's a significant challenge. But if you can overcome those hurdles, like when I was, I got my license in 2012. Wow. Okay. But when I was going around to bars and restaurants, nobody believed I was a brand owner. I would show up and they'd go, oh, deliveries are around the back. <laughs> I own the brand. Okay, but like, no, like, I own the, I had to like, <laughs> people. I'll, I'll never forget being asked to give a presentation at my distributor in 2014. It's the it's a, it's a annual general sales meeting. They've got 400 sales reps out. I'm sitting in the lobby, fiddling my thumbs, waiting for my turn to speak. I go, I give my presentation. I get a standing ovation. I leave. I don't think twice about it couple of months passed by and they asked me to come pour at their spring portfolio tasting and the receptionist remembers me and she runs up and she gives, she gives me a big hug and she goes you know I wanted to tell you when you were here earlier in the year waiting to give your presentation security called and asked if there was a problem wow okay okay again I'm the brand owner and y'all invited me to come speak but for some reason, the black guy sitting in the lobby is a, like, what did they think I was going to do? So, do your own products. <laughs> and there, have, there have been some challenges along yes. the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I am uniquely broken in that I don't know what I can't do. Um, mm -hmm. So the challenges were all just one other thing to sidestep. Right. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, it's an incredible story because it does, it does show, uh, I think it's one of the lines I love what, what you said was, um, you was the only black man making liquor in, uh, in America um, back then and not much change now. <laughs> um, and it's probably still the same now. Well, it, let, let, let me, let, let's be real clear about this. There were a handful of people who had contract bottling situations. There were a handful mm -hmm. of people who had import licenses. But an actual DSP, in 2012, it was just me. 
Uh, okay. Now I think there are five or six of us. We got Chris Montana. We got Fred, We got Fawn. We got mm. uh, another brother up in New Hampshire. Like now there's a few of us, but mm. and still considering that we've had something like 2000 new craft distilleries in the last 10 years, the percentage of either black or women owned uh, distilleries, it's minuscule. And, right. and, okay. and, and I, I really want to say that it's not because, again, it's not because people don't have the knowledge, not because they don't have the desire. The desire and the knowledge has always been there. The first distillers were women. Let's be honest about this. Yeah, Mary Jo. Yeah. It, there are barriers that are difficult to overcome. And every time one of us uh, surpasses this, it gets a little bit easier for whoever comes after. Right. I mean, how many, I mean, Karen, maybe you how many, how many women now are distillers of, of, of these multiple, multitude of uh, craft distilleries that, uh, that have popped up in America over the last maybe five years? Um, I mean, percentage wise around about. You know, I don't think anybody's done really, really good, hard research on this. I don't think any of our industry groups have asked this question specifically. Um, so I've, because I head up the Women's Distillery Guild and I feel like it's kind of my, it's important to, to know and understand. I, from what I understand in the US, the number of women who are actively hands-on with stills and fermentation tanks and bottling lines in the US is less than 7% of the total people working in the, in the industry, not just as distillers. So. It's a really small number still. Um, I think we've done a much better job of getting visibility to the ones that are there. It's been a big mission of mine for a long time is to build the visibility because when you build the visibility, then other people think, oh, maybe that is a job that I could get. And then they you know, apply for the job, but then oftentimes they're negatively reinforced because they don't have enough experience, but how do you get experience if nobody will hire you because you're a woman? So yeah. there's been a, you know, a long cycle um, in the business, but I compared to 12 years ago when I knew one other woman um, who was Mel Heim, she was the head distiller um, up in Portland, Oregon. Um, she's you know, worked with a number of different companies over there, but she was the only woman I could find uh, then who actually had her hands on stills and um, you know so there have been women working in PR and women you know doing a lot of different positions waiting tables and you know in tasting rooms but ownership leadership distilling management etc is still a, an incredibly small number and in preparation for today I was looking up some numbers in the general world of finance and venture capital in America. And I was absolutely flabbergasted to learn that the number of teams, number of, of owners coming into venture capital in America that are black is 1%. Wow. 1%. Wow. And I, that I just, you know, because we know that that doesn't at all represent the number of mm. businesses that are black owned that need yeah. capital. Um, they're yeah not seeing it as even an option. Well, I mean, you, you, you touched upon the point. The you said they're not seeing as an option. Sorry, Jackie, you was about to say? say? Here's a fun stat to remember. Mm. There are more Fortune 500 CEOs named Dave than there are black Fortune 500 CEOs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, well, my favorite one's Melody, but let's move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, in fact, actually, what you mentioned, Karen, was, was is an important part because there has to be some sort of um, there has to be some sort of um, uh, way that we can actually bring people through um, our own, whether it be women or people of color, would be the industry. And one of the things I did find out of what I saw recently was the the initiative that Jack Daniels and Uncle Nearest are doing, um, which I just that just blew me away because you would have thought that the, the big massive companies would have done that. You know, the, the same big companies that talk and spend loads of money at Tales of the Cocktail and their big parties and that type of stuff. Um, but for, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the initiative that you guys are doing with, in, in what, with, with Jack Daniels? Yeah, the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative is, is precisely what Karen was talking about. When I was looking at uh, specifically the American whiskey industry, I have to admit, I've not gone into the overall spirits industry. So I'm, I'm pretty 
tunnel vision on uh, the American whiskey industry. But one of the things that when I was looking at it and talking to other African Americans in high level positions within our industry. So take, for instance, Sagamore Spirits out of, of Maryland, owned by Kevin Plank, Under Armour. Well, his number four uh, employee for Under Armour, he asked to do him a favor. Uh, this is the guy who, who created the Under Armour logo, the Under Armour branding, the Protect Your House, everything about it. And, and he asked him to do him a favor after 20 years at Under Armour and to also uh, take some of his team and go lead up Sagamore Spirits and really get that off the ground. He had tried to do it with a team. It wasn't working. And so he's like, I need my Under Armour people because this isn't working. And so he brought, took his um, master's number four employee to go over there, who went over, completely changed the, the story from being this white elitist Vanderbilt, you know, horse farm to talking about ride preceding bourbon in America and really telling that sort of founding uh, whiskey story. And so he did all of that. And, and he had asked to talk to me about the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative. And so I got on the phone with him. And about 30 seconds into the call, I said, I'm sorry, can I pause you for a second? You're black. I mean, <laughs> 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 and, and, and he says, yes, I am. I am, in fact, African-American. I said, why do we not know this? And he said, that's precisely why I wanted to talk to you. And he said, he said, uh, he said, here is he said, I heard you talk about what you had discovered in the industry, not just with other people, but with yourself in terms of African Americans and the fact that as a group of people, we are religious in how we grow up. We either grew up as Christians or we grew up as Muslim, vast majority of us. Well, both the ministers and the pastors rail against whiskey against the alcohol industry. So we're not going to see this industry as virtuous. So if we're going through a STEM program at school, if we're in chemistry or any of those kind of things coming through college, when we're looking at a career, it will not be whiskey. So right, that yeah. is one of the one of the big issues. But the other big issue is is if we don't see ourselves out there, then we're not going to attract more people who look like us. To, to Karen's point earlier, well, we can't do that if those who are in it don't want to come forward. So the reason why Marcus was reaching into me is he says, you said something and it really resonated, which was I, we're hiring for a director of marketing position. And we had hundreds of resumes that came through. And this has been the case from day one that I began is that out of every hundred resumes I get, I may get one resume from a qualified person of color. I will not get resume. And keep in mind, when I say qualified, I'm not asking for experience in this industry because I already know there's not a whole lot of us. I'll take you from any industry <laughs> and I don't require a college education because I am a believer that a lot of people go straight from high school to becoming great at what they do in their craft. And so it's not like I have these high bars that you have to hit in order to apply. And I still wasn't getting applications from people of color. And, but when my, when my senior VP reached into me and she says, Fawn, I want to share these resumes with you, but I can't because for some reason, you don't have Uncle Nearest on your LinkedIn page. Wow. Now, wow. mind you, I would updated my LinkedIn page. I had Nearest Green Foundation, but everything I had was under Grant Sydney, which is my investment vehicle that owns Uncle Nearest. But it's still, it's still the same thing. I'm still the CEO of both. I'm still the owner of both. But I had chosen to say Grant Sydney. And I hadn't thought anything about it. And I realized that was a subconscious decision because I'm the child of two teetotalers. I yeah. am very religious in terms of involved in, in my church. And, and so I didn't realize it until she said it. So I updated my LinkedIn page. I mentioned this on a video thing that I was doing. And mm -hmm. that's where Marcus saw me and he reached into me and he's like, it pierced me because I realized that for the last five years, I have been here. I brought my entire team to Sagamore Spirits. And if you looked on my LinkedIn page, it'll say Sagamore Hotels, Sagamore Properties. I never once added Sagamore Spirits. 
the number two person at Jack Daniel Distillery is black. Try Googling him. You won't see a picture anywhere. Not because they don't want him out front, but his wife is heavily involved in the church, in the community. Right. It's not something that his parents and grandparents will celebrate. And so that's already a hurdle we have to get over is that we have to make this industry. Karen, what did you what did you call it? I just call it I just call it making it cool, but you had a much better phrase for it. Um, I'm not sure what I said, but <laughs> it's interesting, Fawn, because what you're saying also really applies to women in the industry that we, you know, are still associated with prohibition. And yeah. we were, you know, women in general were on a campaign in the early, you know, the 1920s era to eliminate out the sale of alcohol from the entire country of the United States. And and we have had to really build our credibility back to say, we actually believe in this and we wanna be part of this and we're not gonna judge anyone for getting, you know, drinking alcohol. And we, we think women are capable of drinking alcohol because it's that's recent history. It's not that long ago that we kind of took down the whole industry in a way, not for me. <laughs> Uh, you know. Let you know how powerful we are, that we, <laughs> that we can take alcohol from a whole bunch of powerful men. Uh, uh, but <laughs> but it, is, it, is, it is from this understanding and me looking at it and saying, okay, I think the word you used, Karen, was visibility, improving the visibility. And, and when I looked at it, I said, listen, we've got to make this cool for African Americans, for people of color, for women to come into this industry, for us to see this as a place where we can grow a place that is embracing of us, that means we have to be out front. The problem mm -hmm. is, is every single African American I've spoken to in this industry and in any position of power, any high level position, I've only spoken to one who got into the industry intentionally. And that's Ebony Majors over at uh, the, the Blender over at Bullet, at Diageo. Outside of that, every single African American I've spoken to kind of stumbled into this space and never really got comfortable with it. And so right. they're not comfortable being the face. Well, we need some more that are the face of this industry that are successful, that we're, we're the ones who are gonna attract them in. Because if you don't see us in places of success, then why would anyone come in at the, the lower levels to work their way up if they don't see anyone at the top? And if those in our industry who are African-American who are at the top, the head of human resources for Jack Daniel, I mean, for Brown Foreman is black. Most people don't know that either. I'm like, Crystal, yeah, yeah, can y'all come yeah. out of hiding, please? Uh, <laughs> and, but if we're not out front and no one sees it, then we're not getting the resumes. And so where the, the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative began it was over a year ago. We began by, uh, I went to the, the president of Motlo State College, who's African-American man, brilliant man, and Dr. Michael Torrance, and I was explaining to him what I'm sharing today. And I said, listen, I don't get any resumes. And if I, as an African-American, who has the brand, who has commemorated the first African-American, and I, the first bottle to have an African-American on it, the first distillery to be named after an African-American, if I'm not getting resumes, nobody's getting resumes. Yeah. And so yeah. how do we how do we build that? And so the idea was to build a pipeline. And so that became the near screen uh, school of distilling. And so I went to him and I said, listen, we want to bring in more people of color. We want to bring in more women. The number two over at Jack Daniel, who I mentioned is African-American, Melvin Keebler. He had been going to HBCUs and trying to draft people <laughs> into the industry for about the last five years and was having no luck getting these guys from the, the STEM programs into the distilling industry. And so this became a way of figuring out how do we bring more in? Okay, near screen school of distilling. We are going to create an actual accredited degree in which people can have a degree in distilling. All of a sudden it's honorable. So we began working on that, and then Melvin Keebler, they're, they're number two, and then uh, Sherry Moore, our director of whiskey operation, wrote the curriculum. They wrote the entire curriculum, and uh, the school passed it through, all their board and all the rest of that stuff. So now it's actually sitting with the state, with the board of regents. As soon as they approve it, it goes on to the accrediting body. Once that happens, it will be the first uh, degree for distilling in our country.
and it will be wow. named after an African American at a school named after an African American. So it's amazing. I, I want to see Jackie teaching that, uh, teaching on that, that course as well. <laughs> as one of the first distillers. <laughs> I want so to see you teaching. I know, right? So that is that is where this began, was a year ago. And then when everything began happening, when we had Ahmad followed by uh, Brianna, followed by George Floyd, when all of that happened, all of a sudden, uh, it became a question of, all right, we're, we're creating this pipeline, but that's really for diversifying our industry 10 years from now. How do we make this industry cool for women and people of color now? How do we start getting those resumes flowing in from the other industries? There's plenty of people in other industries who it, their skills are transferable to ours if they would, if they knew. And mm -hmm. so, so how do we do that? And the, the leadership of the Brown Foreman, CEO, CBO, president, all those guys, they reached in and they said, you know, what can we do? What can we do together that will impact change right at this moment versus what we've been working on to impact change later? And so we really thought about it. And if you think about the program, it is a program, sorry, that literally could not have been started before this reckoning in this country. Wow. Because the business incubation program mm -hmm. in and of itself, we are currently helping five different African-American uh, owned or black owned distilleries and brands, and we're coming alongside them. We are building them up. That means that we are giving them the resources that they need from marketing, sales, PR, operations. And I mean, I could run through what we're doing with each of the companies because they're all different, what we are doing. But if you think about it, we're not going to be owners at all. Mm -hmm. We don't benefit from any of these. So imagine Brown Foreman, a publicly traded company, goes to their shareholders and says, hey, so we're going to work alongside Uncle Nearest, who we don't have any, biz any ownership in or any business yeah. arrangement, and mm -hmm. we are going to help build competitors in which we don't have any wow. business wow. arrangement. Wow. That is something that would be impossible outside of this environment. Yeah. So what, yeah. what this environment has allowed us to do is to come up with creative solutions to diversify our industry that would absolutely not have been possible had this not happened in our country. So that's the business incubation program. That is the nearest green school of distilling. Those are two of the programs. The third program is our lap. It's our leadership acceleration program where we are taking incredible people of color from specifically black Americans here in this country that already are in our industry, but for whatever reason have not been able to move into roles that they wanted. So for instance, a master distiller role, unless somebody dies, those positions don't become available. You literally, yeah. somebody yeah. has to die or somebody has to start it themselves. That's basically the only way you're really getting into a master distiller position, or you're essentially coming in as a number two for 15, 20 years before you'll ever see that spot. And yeah. so the question was, how do we bring people and elevate them to these positions? Well, one, you have to get everyone in the industry to agree to open up these positions, even if it means that you're opening up a position you didn't expect to open up. We need you to open that up because if more of us are not in head of maturation, head stiller, uh, the distillery plant manager, operations manager, head of marketing distribution, if people aren't seeing that, we're not going to be able to attract more in. So the apprentice program, we literally are matching their salaries to teach them. Right, wow, wow. Ooh, I wish we had some of that over here in, in the UK, because- yeah, <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> I, well, we'll start it here and then hopefully somebody over there will, will take the lead after they've seen the success of this. And, yeah. but we've, I mean, the apprentices that are coming on board as they're announced, I think it'll blow you all's mind uh, to learn that some people that are actually in marketing positions trained mm -hmm. under Dave Pickerel, but no wow. distiller position became available. And so now yeah. going and finding those guys and saying, we're gonna create the positions for you, we're going to elevate you, and we are going to pay you to learn the job you want it to do. And again, that's something that I don't believe could have happened outside of the current environment. And yeah. so we're taking advantage of the fact that what is happening right now really gives us the room to do some extraordinary things that 
under normal circumstances aren't possible. Wow. I mean, uh, it's, it, it, you mentioned point and, and Karen also mentioned the point, which I want to move over to Jackie. It's, it, it, it connects to how this seminar was originally pitched, which was pretty much nearly about eight, nine months ago. So it was actually last year that this was actually pitched before they, they put it together was, was about the industry. How do we see, how do we, how are we going to be inspired if we're not seeing enough of ourselves in front of us at, um, at a lot of these events? So we go to Tales, um, we look at our industry magazines, we look at the, the trade media that promote um, um, our leaders in the industry, but there aren't, I, I don't see enough leaders in our industry that look like me, just like over the last few years, well, the last year or so, we've been trying to elevate and promote more women within our industry to become leaders and respect them. So Jackie, I want to put to you, do you see, it's a blunt question, are there enough people of color, are there enough black people um, as leaders in our industry? And if there are, where are they? Enough, no. No, there's not enough. Uh, it's hard to quantify how much it means to us Anytime there's more than one of us gathered together in one place, you know, for the first few years, <laughs> I of see tales, the selfies. it was yeah. just like, oh, there's Clyde Davis, there's Charles Hardwick, there's uh, Lynn House, mm. there's Frankie. Like it was so few. There's, there's, it was so few of us for so many years, and now, yeah. like, there's a couple. I'm gonna say a couple dozen that you mm -hmm. can pretty much say are yeah. doing things, but enough, not even nearly enough. There's so much talent and so much ability and so many, again, let's use that word underserved communities. There are so many people in underserved communities that have so much that they can contribute. Uh, yes, they, we need to be visible. Uh, the, the interesting thing as Fawn brought out is and, 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 and as Karen put out, a lot of these things didn't seem to matter until recently. Sexual right. harassment has been around forever, but yeah. you know, we, had, we had the Me Too movement and suddenly it mattered. It mattered, yeah. Racism has been around forever. And just recently we've had an international Black Lives Matter movement and now Black Lives Matter. So all of a sudden, these stories that we've been telling all along now have relevance. So I kind of feel yeah. like, there's always going to be ebb and tide. While the flow is with us, we should entirely push to put as many of us out front as possible. We need to, we need to do everything we can to create our own spaces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I fully agree with you, but I also, I, I mean, I have sometimes a, a little bugbear when it comes to our industry. I love our industry. I've been in this industry for nearly 30 years now. And as I said, I, I worked my way up and created my own job and only because I, I wanted to create my own value. I didn't want anyone to say to me, you were worth this. I was like, no, I'm going to create my own value. I'm going to create my own title. I'm going to be a global ambassador for rum and I'm going to create the world's first rum festival 14 years later or celebrating our 14th year this year. But um, when, I, when I look at our magazines, I look at the trade events, um, I, I called out a couple of them a couple of years ago, the, the, the big massive event where I looked at the leaders that were putting up on, putting to represent our industry. And uh, at first you didn't see many women. Then the Me Too movement came around and we then started promoting women. And it was a case of, well, wait a minute, I didn't realize she was, yeah, exactly. She's the first female master blender. She is the first female distiller. She is a great distiller. She is a great blender. Just happens she's a woman. This, so we started seeing that as the, the, the becoming the new norm, but we haven't seen that yet of, of black people within the industry. I don't see enough of them in the magazines. I mean, you can pick up any of the Spirits magazine now, and I challenge anyone who watches this, go and look at the Spirits magazine, and it's like spot the, the, the black face. And you've mentioned all these leaders, you've mentioned all these people within the industry, uh, Jackie, and we don't see them enough. So how is a new person that's looking to get into the industry? How is a woman looking to get in the industry? Um, who, who is she gonna be inspired by? Who is that young black person gonna be inspired by? Who is that Asian person over here in the UK gonna be inspired by if we don't see enough of these faces or these leaders in our media? And that's a question I like to pose to, I'll, I'll put that to Karen. 
um, because of course you're one of the you're one of the inspirations for a lot of women that want to get into the industry. Do you see enough? Well, it's been interesting to me on so many different levels. Everything you just said, I was like, I was like popping. Um, but you know, one of the reasons that I loved the rum world from day one, why it's you know why it's been such a passion for me for more than thirty years now, is that it is so diverse compared to other. I mean, at Fawn, I'm just super aware that like the whiskey business is still so far behind the rum world, I feel like in, in many ways. Um, I mean, I, I, again, I see more and more women over time. Um, but the other thing is, I, ha I have this crazy theory and I'm really curious what you guys think about it, which is that underserved communities or people who've had to really break down a lot of barriers to get where they are, they're really, they really tend to say a lot of the word we. You know, so like for me, for the first, I don't know, eight or nine years of being in business, I would just always talk about we. I'd be like, well, we did this and we do this and we make this and we, because I just couldn't fathom having gotten to where I was without that team of people kind of blowing wind into my sails. Ian, for, you know, for you, like you were one of the very first people to take me seriously so long ago and to oh. question whether I was capable of growing a rum business. And it was, you know, those little moments were so intense, but it was at the moment at which I started saying, I, like, right. I have a rum brand, I make rum, I have a company, I have a dream, I have a plan, I have a strategy, I wanna do this, I wanna go here, I wanna show up. I want to be on a panel. I want to be recognized in the industry. Everything changed. And I do think that that's something that we are never taught. Like we have to own our space. And so when you were saying that, Ian, about being like, I want to bring my own value, um, it's almost antithetical to the whole world of being an underserved community. Because if all we did was try to bring our own value, we would have, you know, many of us would have never made it as far as we did. So um, yeah. I think that is my one piece of advice to people who are out there trying to create their own value is be willing and able to say, I do this, I want this, I am capable of this. And people mm -hmm. take you much more seriously because for me as a woman, they would be looking behind me like, okay, who is this we and where's the person who's really in charge for so yeah. Wow, wow. Powerful, powerful, powerful. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at the little timer right there because I know we've got our little comments in there. You know what we haven't spoken about in the little time we have? We haven't spoken about drinks <laughs> at all. <laughs> we haven't spoken about drinks. This is a chance to give it, because I know, I know that what's going to, there could be people watching this. And beforehand, I think of maybe a week before, they're going to have the opportunity to actually buy some of the products that we recommend or we're connected to. Now, um, I've been trying, finding it hard to try and get the sorrel liqueur. And I, I, I remember seeing it in my early days of going to Tales, but I was still finding my way around and um, just saying to myself, I've just been happy to be here in New Orleans. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, I got nominated for some award. And I thought, yes, I've arrived because I've been nominated. And then they get nominated seven years in a row without winning. So it just became a glass <laughs> other. I finally won two years ago, but after seven years of nomination in the same category, anyway, but I couldn't <laughs> get the sorrow anywhere. Couldn't get it. But Karen, I nearly got you. I nearly got your rum over here in the UK. <laughs> There's nearly a lot of rum over there now all of a sudden. It's coming up. The only, the only thing I could get was, <laughs> the only thing I could get was, Whiskey. I'm a rum man. <laughs> it's sorrel spices. I'm, I've got. I've got whiskey. So you've got actually you've got two minutes. No, let me make it one and a half minutes to give me a, a little plug about your products. I'm going to start with Karen because your rum's over here. It's also in the states. Um, and then I'm going to go to Bourne, and then I want to. And then Jackie, me and you, you're going to plug something you're going to do in the future. Okay. So we're going to start off with Karen. You got, you got 90 seconds. Give me a plug about your rum. My elevator pitch. Okay. Well, you told me to have a bottle here, and that's the one thing I forgot. But while everybody <laughs> else is pitching, I will, um, I'll go grab it out of my cabinet over there and show you. But 
You know, um, I started a rum company in 2008 and it was all based on the fact that I love rum cocktails more than any other cocktails. If you give me any opportunity to go into a bar, I'm going to want a rum cocktail. I always have. And as all of us in this group know, they've been underrepresented and underserved in bars around the world for so long until fairly recently. And now there's this rum cocktail revolution going on that's like the the warmest thing to my heart I've ever seen. And uh, other than, you know, a lot of social justice things that I'm seeing. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to make a rum that met my palate that was not sugar added, that was distilled in a transparent way when nobody was talking about what they were doing back in those days. I wanted to be able to make it with American sugar cane in a sustainable fashion. Um, those were, nobody was talking about sustainability. Nobody was talking about where their sugar cane even came from 12 years ago. <laughs> so I wanted to introduce some conversations and bring uh, to light the fact that there are some very complicated aspects of the rum industry, the way our sugar cane is harvested, the way many of the people who actually do the work are recognized in the industry and paid in the industry and their health status. And I could go on for days. You all, yeah. most of you know, because you've heard me do some whole long seminars on just that. <laughs> so, I, I love rum. I love rum cocktails. I absolutely love making rum and mountain American rum is kind of off the, off the beaten track, but it's, it's getting more and more recognized. In Crested Boot. Crested Butte. Damn, I'm really going <laughs> to. Karen, is that B-U-T-T-E? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, fun. Uh, Uncle Nearest, yeah. 90 seconds, took out a whiskey. Yeah, Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey. It's all those guys back there. Uh, <laughs> they sit in the back of my, of my office, so it's very easy. But uh, our whiskeys, there is, there's nothing younger than seven-year-old. And our brand is named after the first African-American master distiller on record. And, and so it was important that if we were going to bring forth his whiskey that was so well known when he was alive under different brand names, uh, that what we had to bring forth was going to be excellent. That was going to live up to not only those standards, but allow us to cement his legacy for centuries to come. And so I think, Ian, you mentioned at the top of the hour that it is the most awarded American whiskey of 2019. To date, nobody's even close to us at this point in 2020. We've won everything from world's best back to back by Whiskey Magazine there in London and in New York. Uh, best yeah. Tennessee whiskey three times in a row by uh, Cigar and Spirits Magazine, Double Gold from San Francisco. Pretty much if there was a top award, Chairman's Trophy from the Ultimate Spirits uh, Award, if there is a top trophy, we've won it. And, and it, 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 it's, and so I, I think we're close to 100 awards since we debuted in the middle of 2017. And again, it's because the way that we set out to do this was to make sure that we weren't creating a brand that was going to become very popular, get sold to somebody else. And no, it was important that this brand not only stay minority owned, woman owned, black owned, but that what we were establishing here was something that made sure that centuries from now when people are looking at Johnny, Jim, and, and Jack on the shelf, they're also looking at Nears. That's what we set out to do, and, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. I'm wicked. Absolutely amazing. Love the story. Love the product. Obviously, love the, love the whiskey. Not as good as <laughs> rum, but it's not bad. It's not yeah. bad. <laughs> I, I'm not mad. I love my rum too. I love my rum too. <laughs> okay, Jackie. Okay, since I can't get your your sorrow liqueur, but I'm gonna be talking to some. We, we need to talk so we can get it revamped up again and and revitalized. Oh. What's in the future? Sorrel is coming back. Just no, serious. We'll be back in 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 stores. I want to say by this time next year. But here's the thing. Oh, amazing. We're built on a very simple principle. They mm -hmm. was this beverage that sat in the Caribbean for centuries, centuries. Nobody ever thought about putting it in a bottle because yeah. people like me were the, folk, the folks who made it. How Correct. many other beverages are like that around the world? But they've got this great heritage, this great culture, but no one's ever put it in a bottle before. Wow. So my wow. goal is going to be to 
I'm never going to do a whiskey. I'm never going to do a rum. I'm never going to do a gin or vodka. There are enough people that are doing those and doing them well, really well. So that my, no one needs me in those categories. But if I can find unique beverages that are around the world, that again, that have this great cultural history that no one has successfully figured out how to make the shell stable recipe and market it in a, in, a, in a mass fashion, that's my goal. I've got three or four things lined up already to go with the yeah. idea that they will be these category defining products so mm -hmm. the, the great thing about sorel if it made a drink menu if it, if it did well in a restaurant in a bar or in a, in a store is you can't replace it with anything yeah the, it's one of my great selling points when i told to investors we've got a 93 percent reorder rate which is insane wow. for wow. a craft brand my goal is to is to only create products that don't compete with anything else and this mm -hmm. is it's, it, it is against contrary, it's contrary to what the liquor industry tries to do. The liquor industry tries to identify trends and then follow them. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. the hot thing happen? Is gin hot this year? Is rum hot this year? Is tequila hot this year? My theory is the best way to identify trends is to start them. So my plan is to start brand new liquor trends. I can't argue with that. I can't argue that. That's the reason why. That's the reason why I try to set a trend. The world's first African Caribbean rum. But it's not about me. It's about you guys. So uh, <laughs> we're not even. We're, we're not even talking about that. One question before we. I know we have so little time, but Jackie, the Constellation, which is the company that I uh, have got a minority investment from, they just announced a hundred million dollar fund for black owned, uh, you know, minority owned companies to get behind them with venture capital. So I, you know, that may not be the right fit for you. I have no idea, but I'm starting to see that churning, which I think is so great. Give Jackie like an introduction because I know his product's good and he just needs, is it, he was close twice to getting that million dollar deal. And uh, I've, 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 signed, I've signed that contract twice. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the next time I, and this is, this is a thing, you know, it, it is a thing that Fawn will tell you. Um, it is one thing to say, we don't have the opportunity that this is entirely true, but when that opportunity comes, you have to be prepared. Yes. Yeah. Know how to be yeah. a PNL sheet. You've got to yeah. know, like I, I, the opportunities that came my way, I was able to capitalize on because I was prepared when they happened. Mm -hmm. if it, and, and that is, I think, again, something great that is being done with this university is making sure that people will actually have the preparation so they'll know. But we need to prepare people in marketing. We need to prepare people in finance. We need to prepare people in distribution. There's so many aspects to this. But if we can make sure that folks are prepared when that opportunity arises, they'll do well. Well, I think well, to what Karen was saying, I, I, I didn't see the announcement, but I did. Uh, they did reach into me immediately, like I, I want to say a few days ago. So was this a re recent announcement that they did? Yes. Yeah. It, was, it was one of their responses to the BLM movement and to the Excellent. events of more recently. But mm. they, I think they had had it in the pipeline. It just became really timely to announce it. To announce it. Yeah, so they, they reached into me and it is, I'm fully funded. So it, it was a, it was a non-starter for me. It was a non-conversation, but Jackie, based on the information they sent to me, the email, I agree with Karen. It seems like what they're doing could be quite amazing and yeah. fit really yeah. well with what you're doing. Yeah. And again, it's uh, another, another, um, it's another benefit, I think, to the, the situation where we see ourselves now uh, inside the world, that the world has actually stopped, slowed down, and amplified what we've been saying for many, many years. Um, and now is the time for us to actually to be appreciated, recognized, um, well, whether you're Black, you're female, um, you're um, any, any, any way that you've been marginalized. It's, it's, it's for us now to actually be recognized and understood for what we bring to the table um, as such. So 
Um, I know time's running out. I just want to finish off by saying what's called the, that the first step, the first step to any problem is not to hide from it. And the first step to any form of action is awareness. So when race, gender, sexuality, or diversity is brought into a conversation, it generally normally makes people uncomfortable. But as an industry, it's, it's up to us, not only us four, but as an industry, it's for us to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and once we can do that, then we can make real change. And that's what I'd love to see from this industry. Let's, let make, let's continue. Jackie, that's why I love you to, to the, like cook food, make people uncomfortable with being, <laughs> make people comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, so anyway, guys, I'd like to thank you. Thank you again uh, to my uh, amazing guests, uh, Jackie Summers, Fawn Weaver, Karen Hoskins. Um, I can't wait to give you guys a hug in, in real life, in, in person, um, have a drink of you. And, uh, and thank you again to Tales of the Cocktail for allowing us to, uh, uh, giving us this platform to talk about our, our opinions, our views. Um, please, uh, at the end of this, um, Actually, we're not here, but we are going to be there. Put your comments inside there. I'm sure we'll answer those. And yeah, let's do this again, but live. Let's do it again live in front of people. Let's bounce off people. But again, thank you. And I love you guys because you guys are my extended family. Peace. <laughs>